All right, let's 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 begin. Welcome to the Constitutional Transitions Colloquium. I'm Intasar Rav, and I'm, con I'm chairing the session for today with my co-convener, Sujit Chaudhary. And I'll just begin by introducing our guest speaker today. We'll give him uh, about 12 minutes or so to give us some remarks about his paper, uh, and then we'll I'll have some comments, and then we'll open open up to everyone else. So today we're privileged privileged to have Muhammad Fadl, who is an associate professor and Canada research chair for law and economics of Islamic law uh, at University of Toronto. And Professor Fadl uh, has has been there for a few years. He comes there having done a BA and a JD at University of Virginia and gotten a PhD in Islamic law from University of Chicago. Uh, so he's been doing this for a long time, but in addition to all of that, he practiced for several years right down the street at Sullivan and Cromwell here. So he comes not only with uh, the knowledge of the theory of Islamic law um, and, and particularly of the economics of Islamic, of Islamic law and public law theory, uh, but also practice that he he got over several years. And so you see this unique combination. Uh, it, it really is a unique combination in a scholar of his caliber. And I think that's reflected in the complexity uh, of the paper, but also accessibility of the paper. Uh, this uh, paper that he's presenting today is called, Is There Such a Thing as an Islamic Public Law? And Does Its Existence Matter for Post-Authoritarian Arab Regimes? And it's a part of a larger book project that's looking more generally at the intersection between uh, Islamic law or substantive Islamic law called fiqh and uh, the area of political theory in Islamic history called siyasa. And essentially, he's extrapolating from these two areas, which are conventionally dealt with separately, a theory of Islamic law or of Islamic public law that he'll tell us more about now. OK, thank you, Intasar. Thank you, Sajit, for inviting me here. It's always a pleasure to come back to New York. Um, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this paper. And I, I'd like to thank all the students for having uh, submitted comments to me. That was very helpful. Um, what this paper grows out of a long-standing interest of mine, I would say, since I was a graduate student, uh, really, um, in trying to understand the relationship between the ideals of Islamic law, which um, Intasar mentioned, the technical term is fiqh, F-I-Q-U-H, as a body of, um, in theory, an apolitical law, meaning that it's self-standing. It doesn't need a state to produce it, to elaborate it, right? And its relationship with uh, actual historical political institutions. And so these are questions that I've been thinking about for a long time. Um, and if you actually you know, read some of my pre-Arab Revolution <laughs> works, right, um, you could see that I was interested in trying to think about how Islamic law relates to public institutions. And then, of course, 2011 came, the fateful year 2011, and all these things I was thinking about suddenly became of, of highly practical relevance, something that I've never been used to before. <laughs> because <laughs> Most of my work was always very historical and theoretical, and suddenly there seemed to be some sort of demand that it uh, demand for it on the practical side. I don't know how practical it is, but um, I do like to think that theoretical analysis and con and issues of uh, principal justification of institutions do matter for the long term stability and legitimacy of, legitimacy of institutions, and I think that is one of the preconditions for a stable democracy, not the only one. Uh, maybe I didn't put sufficient caveats in this paper. I would never say that ideological divisions are the only obstacle to a successful um, transition to a democratic constitution in the post-authoritarian Arab states. But it is an obstacle, and it may be a significant one. It may be decisive. I suggest that it, prevent, it, may, it may be so important that it prevents parties from thinking about the other issues because they never get to them, right? Uh, it's hard to say, right, from, a, from an empirical perspective, what's really the most important one. I would just like to say that I think it is an important issue. 
And from that perspective, what I'm trying to do is try to give a principled analysis to one side of this ideological fight. What does Islamic law have to say about public order? Right? Now, I think part of the problem is that I think lots of secondary scholarship assumes that there is a self-standing thing called Islamic law that stands in opposition to law that is made by secular institutions. And so there's only, there only, there's only two possible relationships. Either secular authorities simply stand as faithful enforcers of this body of law, right? or they just ignore it. So it's a kind of hierarchical relationship. One dominates the other. right? And that's the only possible configuration of the two. Um, and in my reading of Islamic law, I didn't find that kind of oppositional relationship to be reflected actually in substantive legal doctrine. So if we go back to this idea of fiqh as a self-standing apolitical set of rules that are elaborated independent of the state, one of the paradoxes is they're constantly making references to public officials. Right? So there's no sense, if you just read the rules, that the idea of that the state is an alien institution existing outside of its own normative uh, scope or, or domain of regulation. So uh, this, this apolitical body of law fiqh, itself contains um, a set of ideals, implicit, implicit ideals I would argue, or largely argue, about the nature of the state, the nature of the legitimacy of the state, um, and the nature of its authority and what it can do. And so what I'm trying to do in this is unpack what those values are, right? And try to figure out what the relationship between the two so that we can go beyond this idea that either the state is simply enforcing these rules or it's uh, flouting them, right? Because in either case, there is no, in that model, there is no normative role for politics. Okay? In that conception of Islamic law and its relationship to the state, there's no place for politics. Right? Either, either you have an a, or you have amoral force on the one hand, or you just have religious law. You don't have principled politics that can negotiate between the two. So a lot of what this project is motivated by is the idea, is trying to answer the question, is there such thing as an Islamic political domain that is non-theological? Right? And that's what I'm trying to sort of unpack by looking at detailed rules of Islamic substantive law. And so uh, my basic conclusion is yes, there is. Right? And the basic ideal is manifested through a conception of the public order as one um, of agency. That a fundament the fundamental normative uh, con uh, relationship of politics is that of agency. There is a principle. The principle is an idealized Muslim community that is made up of, uh, of actual individuals, of course, but there, it's an ideal in the sense that the, um, the content of the values of this community is defined by uh, this law. Not in the sense that it tells them what to do, right? but it puts certain limits on their freedom both affirmatively and negatively, meaning that there are certain things that they must do, certain things that they must refrain from. But within that, there is freedom, right? And that's specifically where the domain of politics comes into existence. But in order for that to be manifested, you need to have uh, a figure that can represent this principle, right? So the public, and that comes into existence through the idea of the caliphate, right? And the caliph, that's why you have this notion of contract uh, between the Muslim community and this person that's called the caliph, right? And I try to go beyond, I think, the secondary literature, which just focuses on this contract and tries to treat it as an empirical reality rather than a political ideal. And by doing so, I think it misses the larger point. The larger point being that this, I this idea of the, 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 the Islamic social contract, so to speak, is to give some kind of um, institutional expression for the possibility of this normal, normative politics to arise. And so we see that in the way that the jurists describe all these institutions and their functions. And um, you know, basically I give you several examples of how this principle of agency works its way through right, in the juristic description of the powers of these public agents. Right? Um, 
And so again, I think this is one of the frustrating aspects of this project is that Muslim, pre-modern Muslim jurists did not have a, an abstract discussion of all this. Rather, this just comes up interstitially right, in their discussion of very specific rules. Right? So I give the example of the power of electors to depose. So one might think if the electors have the power to appoint, they should have the power to depose. Right? But the jurists say no, because in both cases, they're acting in right of this, the Muslim community. And so they can only depose if there's legal cause, right? because they're not exercising a personal privilege in appointing the way a private principal does. Right? They're only acting as a, a, a principal. They're acting on behalf of a public persona, which is the Muslim community. Having discharged that obligation, their role comes to an end until such point in time that the public agent breaks the law and now is, in, is, 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 is worthy of deposition. Right? And so I, I, I try to point out very, several, several different rules that illustrate this point. Right? Um, and so I think that's you know, trying, to get, trying to fight the idea that the only thing that we should worry about is the, the actual election process. No, there's lots of other kinds of rules right, that, that illustrate this basic point of agency. Now it flows from the idea of agency, right, as the underlying legitimating principle, lots of important things, right. Um, that's what I try to, you know, try to argue in the paper that if public a if public officials are always at law an agent of this moral community, then that implies certain things, right. It implies, for example, that the principle can place conditions on the authority of the agent. And we see that very nicely, I think, in the selection I gave to you from al Kassani, where I think is really, you know, extraordinary language, which he when he tells us that, um, you know, when the caliph appoints an official or dismisses an official, he's he's really only acting as a representative of the Muslim community. So in all cases, it's the Muslim community who's appointing, who is dismissing, uh, et cetera, because they are acting for their benefit, not for the personal benefit of the ruler who is appointing them. Right? Um, so we have this idea, this fundamental idea, that the legitimate exercise of authority by public officials depends on a grant of authority from the, from the people. There's never any idea of inherent personal authority. Indeed, this is then confirmed by other rules in Islamic law when we look at sovereign immunity. Okay, so Kassani again tells us that the reason why the caliph and other public officials enjoy sovereign immunity Right? It's because they're agents. And so they have immunity to the same extent that all agents have immunity. Namely, if they are acting within the scope of their authority, right, um, then it's the principle that bears liability, not the agent. In cases where they exceed that authority, they are no longer an agent. They are just a private person, and they're liable just like anybody else. Right? So um, you know what, again, what I'm trying to do here is sort of develop a bottom-up theory, right, of where sort of constitutional values um, can be justified from within the Islamic tradition, as opposed to some kind of um, abstract theological theory of, of where it comes from. Now, why do I think this is important? I guess this is this is the point of this uh, colloquium, right? Um, we need to try if you're. If you are of a mind to want to avoid civil war and civil strife and um, these things, right? You want to try to find uh, commitments or basic fundamental commitments that a large majority of your citizens can buy into, right? And I think this is a potential way to uh, achieve a certain kind of reconciliation between so-called Islamist forces and non-Islamist forces. Uh, because I think both parties are laboring under this false notion that Islamic law is this take it or leave it kind of package, right? So that if you are committed to Islamic law and you are opposed to certain historical interpretations, your only choice is to engage in reinterpretation, right? Because the idea is it's self-executing and you have no choice in the matter, right? Both parties, I think, have this conception of Islamic law that it's outside of the domain of politics, right? Whatever it is, it's got to apply, right? And either you accept it or you don't, right? So that creates a kind of zero-sum 
uh, game. It doesn't allow for real politics, right? Um, but the way I'm trying to conceive of Islamic law, I view it as a kind of, um, if you want to look at it this way, uh, there's a set of, we can say, pre-political law, right, that is amenable to revision through deliberative politics, right? Because I, I try to show uh, some basic principles or some opinions of the pre-modern jurists, right, that uh, because the ruler or public officials are agents, right, legislation is not a competitor to revealed law. It's just the, the manifestation of the public will, right? So just like a private person has authority to engage in contracts and marriages, blah, 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 blah. The public has authority to engage in all these different things. And the way the public engages in, the, in, in its, the way the public exercises its personality is by making rules, right? And it does this through what the jurists call tasarruf al imama, which I translate as a public act. And the only question is whether this public act is valid or not. But if it is, right, then it's perfectly part of you know, Islamic law in a political sense because it's been authorized by it, right? And in, in, when you look at the way the jurists set out criteria for determining when such acts are legitimate and when they are not, they never said that they're limited to what is permissible and, imper and impermissible under the law that the jurists elaborate, right? So they could go beyond what the jurists said. They could create obligations where none existed, right? Um, and so all the sorts of the regulations or the, 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 the um, reforms that have taken place in the modern period right, no longer need to be justified through some kinds of interpretations, new interpretations of revelation. You can just say straight out, this is what we think is our, in our public interest. Right? You don't need to say like the Tunisians did in abolishing polygamy that, well, the Quran properly read doesn't allow it. Right? You don't need to engage in that theological argument. You can just say that our, our public will is that we don't want to allow this anymore. And that would be perfectly consistent with a valid public act because it's not commanding anybody to do an, something that's immoral. Right? That was one of, the, one of the standards for the validity of a public act. You can't compel an individual to, to, to sin, right? But you don't have, but you, no person has a private right to do anything he or she wants if the public will wants to prohibit it for a good valid reasons. Now, if you go back to the paper, I talk about that there's substantive criterion, uh, procedural right, uh, criterion, et cetera, that attach to when a public act is valid. All of these things, I think, uh, derived from the idea of the agent, the agent acting on behalf of the principal. He has to have proper jurisdiction. It has to be rational for the benefit of the principal, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So what I'm trying to suggest is that these ideas of, of procedural and substantive rationality and legitimacy, limited, pow limited, um, limited powers, right, um, provide a kind of common ground between Islamists who are committed to the procedures of democracy and non-Islamists, right, who are worried that they, that these are um, that uh, the the commitment to uh, popular governance is really a ruse for introduction of clerical governance, like let's say in Iran, right. Um, so that's the basic, I think, the basic points of the paper and the motivations behind it. And I welcome your comments. Thank you. All right, great. So. I want to start off by, by well, first thanking you for, for presenting such a, um, you know, sort of tour de force and, and accessible prose throughout these various genres of Islamic legal literature, and you highlight the uh, treatises on governance on judicial manuals and really doing something new here and extracting public law rules from ordinary legal treatises. Um, and, and sort of within that managing to show us or tell us about uh, different types of uh, economic theory, Pareto efficiency, Caldo Hicks efficiency. <laughs> that was just like a footnote. The, <laughs> in, in public welfare definitions within the Islamic legal tradition. Um, but I, I want to ask a couple of questions. Um, one of them, just to ask if you, invite you to elaborate on a point that you end the paper with uh, as you 
uh, sort of extrapolate out from your comments to one of the debates that you have with another scholar of Islamic law, um, Khalid Abu al on democracy and Islamic law. Uh, and, and I recall that debate sort of unfolding in the Boston Review of Books, right, in 2003, mm -hmm. um, prompted by the events of September 11th, and then 10 years later, uh, we find that this is even more relevant uh, to the, the post-uprisings Arab Middle East. And you say that um, part of the problem or the nature of the dispute between you two is that uh, Khalid Abu al has what you might deem a narrow definition of both Islamic law and of popular sovereignty based on his premise that Sharia or Islamic law is always aspirational. Um, it's not real state law, that all rules of Islamic law are peremptory norms that come from this interpretation, interpretive tradition of fiqh, of the, the substantive rules of Islamic law. And you wish to expand that out to include both interpretation and political deliberation. Um, so as a part of that project, one thing that, that this uh, triggers for me is what do you mean by uh, the validity of political deliberation as a part of Islamic law. Does such political deliberation in the past uh, create substantive rules or models for governance and for conducting um, affairs in that political space? Or is it an argument about political process, that there is some precedence for seeing, uh, for, for opening the sphere of valid decisions that one could call Islamic law decisions um, in the past through political deliberation, and so therefore today political deliberation should also count as Islamic law. So it is, is it a substantive or procedural distinction or both that you're, you're trying well, to make? Well, I think they're, they're both, right? Because the first question is always, does this person who claims to be acting on behalf of the public have legitimacy to do so, right? So um, there's going to be, ha there's always have to be some sort of procedural question is where do you get the authority to make these rules, right? Um, so there's always got to be some sort of procedural question. And so today, modern practice, right, that's why we want to have a constitution. We want to specifically lay out, right, what are the conditions under which a person who is otherwise just the same as you and me, why does this person get to exercise some kind of power over us? In, in some sort of way that distinguishes him from everybody else, right? Um, then we have to have some sort of substantive criteria for when those decisions are binding. It can't just be any kinds of things that he or she says. And those right? come from the pre-political body of no, Islamic law? No, no, it depends. Um, I mean, because what we want is we want the agent, well, at least the way I understand the way pre-modern Islamic law worked, is that uh, the relationship of agency both authorizes action and limits it. It authorizes action taken for the benefit of the principal, right, and pro prohibits him from taking agents, actions that are detrimental to him. Okay? Now, of course, in the pre-modern period, you don't have detailed statutes and con written constitutions and all this other sort of stuff specifying what exactly this means. Right? You do have, though, general principles. Right? So you're sort of bringing up uh, Perito and Caldor Hicks, what I was trying to suggest by that is that Muslim jurists had a very clear idea that a public official was subject to a standard of rationality that private individuals were not. Okay, so the validity of a public act substantively, leaving, assuming that the person has a valid delegation of authority, right, his act must either, right, result in the benefit for everyone, hence being Perito, everybody is better off, nobody is worse off, or it's net beneficial, right? Right? In the in the Caldor Hicks sense, right? Private people aren't under that standard. Right? I can go out and I can give away my property if I'm as an extraordinary generous person, right? And that's perfectly fine. But because these people that we call public officials, right, they don't enjoy that kind of freedom. They're subject to a standard of rationality, substantive rationality. Uh, which private persons are not. Now, why is that, right? Again, because they are, they are agents. That's the only reason why they can bind us. Okay? So, um, you can imagine, in fact, this is what I would try to argue, and I've argued in another context, that 
from the perspective of internal perspective of Islamic jurisprudential theory, how do you understand, how should one understand legislation and written constitutions, et cetera, et cetera? Well, these are simply detailed instructions to one's agents, right? It's not a, comp it's not a competitor to Islamic law, right? It's just the detailed instructions that the principal is giving to its agent on how to exercise the authority that it's been given, right? Because again, the basic foundational idea is these agents have no inherent authority to do anything other than authority that's been given to them by the community. And the reason why their actions bind them is because, just like any other principal-agent relationship, whatever an agent does binds the principal if it's within the scope of the authority. Right? So um, what I would say is that these rules are Islamic in a secondary sense, in that they are rules that are author validly authorized by Islamic law. Right, the way we would think about the difference between constitutional law and statutory law. Right? Statutory law, because it's constitutional, it is valid law. But once it's valid, even though it's not, um, even though it's not commanded by the Constitution, mm -hmm. once it is there and it, it is in place and it is constitutional, it is just as binding as any other constitutional norm. Right? So from once properly enacted, Right? It is part of the American legal system, or the Canadian legal system, or any other kind of constitutional legal system. We don't consider it outside of it. Right? It's part and parcel of it. And in fact, I, would, I want to go further. What's interesting is that if we, if we talk about fiqh as pre-political, mm -hmm. right, it expressly contemplates political law. It can't function without political law. Right? It's, it, would be, it would be amputated. It would be disfigured. It would be completely crippled without the existence of institutions uh, which, have a, 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 which have the authority to make these political rules, right? And so that's why I didn't include this quotation here, that Cassani, the same figure I quote extensively here, says that it's inconceivable, right, that the obligation to set up courts um, could be ever abrogated. Abrogation is a technical term of Islamic jurisprudence. Um, it's inconceivable that the obligation to create courts could be abrogated because it's a rational obligation, right? You can't have a system of rights, which, is, which FIP clearly establishes, and then not have a system of courts and political institutions to adjudicate them. And so there has to be a do legitimate domain for the political that's internal to the FIP. I want to ask another question, a two-part question, that, that gets at these a, a little bit more at the relationship between rights, agency, and the Muslim community or the public. Um, so we know, as you, you've told us in the paper, that Mel Wardi, uh, in his book on, on governance, Ahkam al-Sultaniya, he famously, amongst other jurists in the mm. legal manuals, draws this distinction between rights of God and rights of people and, in categorizing legal claims. And to take the latter mm -hmm. first, so the rights of people, as you know, are areas where individual interests or indi are, are affected, individual claims uh, can be made. So if a borrower defaults on a loan, um, the creditor has a right to be repaid and can therefore pursue a claim on that basis. And then the rights of God have been interpreted to be areas of public law. Um, we might translate it as, and therefore, within the purview of the head of state to ensure or enforce, so that's uh, the ability to levy taxes, uh, to enforce criminal law, to engage uh, in, to declare and, and carry out war. Uh, so as you argue, many of these are, uh, the, this area of rights of God are done for public welfare. Taxes benefit the community, criminal law helps establish order, laws of war are necessary to extend or protect the Muslim community. Um, and Muslim scholars classically have also argued, though, that God's rights may be subordinated to the rights of people um, when only God's rights are involved. So if we, if we take criminal law, for example, and we contrast rape with wine drinking, rape needs to be punished. There was a victim whose individual rights were impinged upon. Uh, wine drinking, by contrast, it's a lot easier to say um, to let the person uh, guilty of wine drinking go free because it's, a, it's sort of a victimless crime. Mm -hmm. Only the rights of God have been offended. And so this is, this is in some of the discussions of the, the classical jurists. Um, it's an easier argument to avoid punishment there. Um, 
So related to all of all of this, I wonder why it seemed that you, in some places in the paper, inverted this to say that the rights of God uh, should always prevail, and, and reading that as the public public law, should always prevail over private rights. And then related to that, I wondered then, when you're talking about agency, agent of whom? Um, so there's also in the paper you define the rights of the Muslim community as the paramount interests that the executive must protect, conceiving of himself as merely the community's representative, um, its agent, not just that he's conceiving of himself as that, but Muslim jurists defines him as that according to the, the uh, foundational text. Um, but elsewhere you give the idea that the caliph or governing authorities stand in the place of the prophet, is the quote of Rasul, of the messenger. No, um, but that's not, sorry. I don't know. Who, is a, who is, in that context, I would imagine a representative of God and this idea of God's right. So do these stand in some tension let me, let me just to one another? And, make, and can you clarify yeah. for me what the relationship is? Let me just is? respond to that last point. Because when Kassani, I'm sorry, I should write on the board. Can I write on the board? Sure. Kassani, in his discussion of agency, is there a chalk? Oh, you're not. Is there? No, there's chalk in here. I just got to open it. It's extremely tightly packed. We don't want you to use it. <laughs> so Cassani, yeah, yeah. in his discussion of jurisdiction and, and, and what happens to judges when the appointing power dies, uses the term Rasul. Now, the problem with this term is uh, it, it has an ordinary linguistic meaning of, mes of, of agent. Agent slash messenger. Okay. It also has a theological meaning of apostle, right? Okay. So what I would say is that in Cassani's reference, it's, 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 it's just agent. It's just a legal term. It has nothing to do with theology. Okay. So when Cassani is using it, he's just using it generically to say that the caliph is not like the messenger of God. He's just like an ordinary agent, right? Because he's exercising the, the jurisdiction, the power of the Muslim community, the wilaya of the Muslim community. So he's not exercising the wilaya of God. He's not exercising the, the sovereignty of God. Right? You will never find a jurist saying that the caliph or any other public official is exercising sovereignty from God. Right? He's always exercising sovereignty of the Muslim community. So that's, a, that's just, a, I think that clarifies the second, the, the second part of the question. The first part of the question, I never use the term rights of God. Right? And I, I do that quite consciously. Because although I know that in the secondary literature, I don't want to take up too many arguments against secondary scholarship because I won't have any friends left. Um, <laughs> I have very just, few to begin with, right? And so and I have to, I have to keep, those, keep those that I have. Even um, if it's not in the secondary literature, then what, how would you well, translate? What I was going to say is that um, I prefer the distinction between inalienable rules right, and permissive rules. Okay. Now, um, it is true that there's this, this, this classification, rights of God, rights of people. Um, it, get, it can get quite complex and quite complicated as to how to resolve them when, they, when they're competing interests at stake. But um, I prefer an even more, even more abstract category of what rules jurors classified as inalienable rules and which rules they did not. Okay? So um, one of the things that's inalienable for example, is the right of the Muslim community not to have their property, de public property, deprived to private interest. Right? Now, they might not call that a right of God. In fact, they'll call it haqqul amma, the, the right of the public. Okay? But it's equally inalienable. That's why the, the public will always have a right to undo a transaction right? which did not serve the public good. Okay? Now, um, and so you know, in a long-term project, a very important project, would be to map out, you know, all the rules of Islamic law. Which ones are, are considered sort of inalienable? You know, you go back, everybody's here. Do, you, people, do, people, do students still read the famous Calabrese article? Yes? Famous yeah. Calabrese. You know, the one view of the cathedral, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So you know how he divides rules into property rules, contract rules, and rules of inalienability, right? I mean, that's something that would be a useful thing to do in Islamic law is to map out what are these rules that the jurists consider to be inalienable. They go a lot, they go, you know, they can go, sometimes they're theologically inspired, sometimes they're just purely public interest, right? Um, and, you know, uh, I guess, you know, we need, we need to do a cartography, so to speak, first, then we can talk 
in specific cases about you know what's the proper balance and how and how to resolve them. But I think there are lots and lots and lots of cases where you have inalienability deriving exclusively from the rights of the community. Lots of cases. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> um, well, I've got three, but if it takes a while, I'll stop. Yeah. Um, in, in the paper, there's a, sense that there's a clear sense that you're focusing on Western writers who are mistaken about the nature of Islamic law. Um, and so um, I'm wondering whether, uh, in fact, this confusion or lack of reference to Prophet Lawrence is true of Islamic writers as well. And some, certain things that you've said here in your paper, where you say this is my reading, um, that maybe this is uh, uh, provocative. And certainly your disagreement with Khalid Abdul al Fadl, which suggests that you know this is an ingenious um, and kind of brilliant uh, work of yours. Um, and I'll take I that. In terms, in terms of the practical point <laughs> yeah. of the exercise, whether this, in a sense, would undermine uh, its, its crossover appeal, because there's a sense in which um, you know if it isn't generally accepted, as I suspect it isn't, then you're going to have to fight two battles, right? First, you're going to have to fight the battle among the Islamic scholars who disagree with your conception of, of, of public law. And then, if, if you win that one, you're then going to have to fight the battle against the non-Islamics. And that seems, you know, a very ambitious, right, in terms of the practical uh, outcome. And so, so that was one uh, concern uh, I had. Um, the, the second question is, um, the shared ideals that you draw, in some sense, seem to exist a very high level of abstraction, right, that what you're taking out from this, the concept of ideals is they have agency, of rationality. So the, the incredibly high uh, level of abstraction, I wonder whether, again, focusing on the practical point of the exercise, um, whether even if there is a shared uh, uh, acceptance of these ideals at such a high level of abstraction, it will result in the type of uh, shared agreements that you think are necessary. I mean, what types of concrete policy agreements do you think would emerge from this acceptance of these concrete ideals? How would they play out, for example, in areas of the role of religion, of religious freedom, of gender equality? And again, I, I wonder whether they're pitched at too high level of abstraction to reach the sorts of agreements at that level that appear to be necessary. Uh, and, and the third question is, um, again, there's a sense in the paper that um, your audience is a very rarefied one. Mm -hmm. and, and you say that it's about um, persuading political elites to come together uh, to share these common ideals. And I wonder if, in the light of the Tunisian and Egyptian revolutions, uh, which seem to be very much bottom-up revolutions, um, you know, that, that is the appropriate audience, that you're going to need to uh, persuade the mass audience, not the type of, uh, you know, sort of rarefied theoretical audience that, to some extent, again, the argument seems, seems to be pitched at. Thank you so for I all excellent questions. Please okay. the questions for the recording. Yeah, sure. Okay, okay. yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so one is just is this misunderstanding of Islamic law something that applies just to the to Western a Western audience or also to Islamic legal scholars? And in which case are you fighting uh, two fronts on the battlefield um, in convincing two different uh, types of audiences about your claims? Secondly, are the shared ideals? Um, they seem to be highly abstract, so how does this play out on the ground and concrete policies um, around things like religion, religious freedom, and gender equality? And third, uh, the, there's a sense that, that the audience, um, as you say in the paper, um, you're targeting the political elite. Might this be something that needs to be targeted uh, to a broader audience of the masses? OK, thank you for the questions. I think they're excellent questions. Um, <coughs> I think your first question is exactly right. I think a lot of Muslim theorists uh, sort of echo this um, binary division, right? That there's either Islamic law or there's secular law, and the twain shall never meet. And there's kind of this implicit war between them, only one that only one can can survive from this battle. Um, and I think you'll you'll see some uh, reformers in the early part of the 20th century um, making these kinds of claims as well that Islamic law didn't provide any kind of systematic account of public life, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I just think they're mistaken, right? Um, there are good reasons why. Um, if, we look at, if we look at sort of historical practice, right, I think w particularly with the transformation of, uh, of, that modernity uh, uh, imposed uh, 
on the political order of the Middle East. The pre-modern sort of constitutional order was clearly insufficient uh, to control government and, and create a legitimate public order. I mean, in another paper I try to argue is that for the pre-modern uh, jurists, ex post review of, of executive action was more than sufficient. And that may have been true the way given the structure of pre-modern life. Right? But with modernity, it was clearly not sufficient. You needed to have some ability to police in an ex ante fashion systematically who those agents actually were. Right? But instead, um, what you had at the, at the, in, in the 19th and 20th centuries, you had a collapsing traditional order that emphasized the, duty of sub, the, the subject's duty of loyalty and obedience to their rulers, even though they were despotic and clearly engaged in, in many sorts of unwise policies. And that, of course, created a reaction among reformers in the latter half of the 19th century and the 20th century. I just don't think that um, they really read the doctrine very fairly right, or creatively. So yes, there has to be an argument on that side too. Right? Um, but it's, I, that doesn't mean that my interpretation although I appreciate being called really, you know, I forget what you said. Um, I actually think it's very, I think it's, yeah. I think it's yeah. very yeah. well documented. <laughs> I think it's very well documented. I mean, I didn't bore people with the numerous sort of examples of how this principle applies out in substantive law. But it's very, very, you know, there's just lots and lots of cases. I'm not, not case law in the, in, the, in the common law sense, but in legal treatises and in, in rules and commentaries and hypotheticals that they provide, the, it would be very hard to resist these sort of basic ideas and, and with lots of practical applications. Now, this is where the issue of abstraction comes in, right? Obviously, in a paper of legal theory, there's going to be a lot of, it's going to be a, a abstract. Now, but what I'm trying to say is, like I said from the beginning, is, you know, really the question is, if you are, if you are committed at all to an idea of an Islamic source of political legitimacy, is there a scope for normative politics? in that? Or is it all just a theological enterprise of figuring out what God wants and just doing it? Right? And so what this paper is just trying to do is show, no, there is a legitimate domain for politics right? in, in, gover in collective governance that does not require theological expertise, that is a product of uh, practical deliberation of the, uh, regarding the common good. Now, of course, that's not going to settle specific problems. right? But what I'm trying to do in this paper is just show that that is perfectly legitimate from within an Islamic perspective, right? And then to say that we can, by using uh, common deliberation, uh, more often than not, we will be able to come up with a solution that is not illegitimate from an Islamic perspective, right? So yes, it is very abstract at this point, and there's no, there's no guarantee that people will be able to deliberate collectively and achieve answers that are satisfactory at all. I mean, I don't think that's the case in most advanced societies, right? Um, but um, you know, again, it, it, the, the purpose of this paper was just to try to create a general framework. Um, now, well, let me give you one specific example, I think, where this is very important and very salient in post-authoritarian societies like Tunisia and Egypt, the question of accountability of government officials. Okay? It's very, very important um, to be able to hold people accountable, right? And I think Islamic law has a very firm commitment to this idea, right, that public officials do not escape liability based on the idea that they were just following the directions of their superiors, right? And we can, you know, you, there are other kinds of things. I think it's also relevant to uh, cases of public corruption as well, et cetera. Um, but that's another paper, really, to try to talk about the specific cases where I think, you know, already established doctrine provides a really good basis for practical solutions, right? But you know, here it's just sort of more the abstract problem of is there an idea of the political at all, right? Then uh, with respect to the audience, again, I, I agree. It's not, I, I would not claim <laughs> that this is going to be a magical solution to anything. This is just more, really, I think, more aimed, I wouldn't even say political elites, but more to sort of intellectuals and intellectual elites for them to try to think um, about a common political culture. Because right now, unfortunately, and it's, it's totally understandable, after 50 years of authoritarian rule, there is no common political culture. And that common political culture has to be built. So I think this is one way of doing it. One small step, not a magic solution um, at all. Right, so.
All right, so I'm uh, collecting names if folks want to be on the queue um, for questions. Lots of names. There are lots of names. Why don't you stick your hands up high so we can see everybody? Lots of people wanting to jump in. Great. And I'll try to do well with the names, otherwise I will point to you. Um, and we'll start with Gianluca. No, uh, I'll be in a line, so I don't want to jump the line. So polite. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, thank you for the paper. I, I have to say that I'm very troubled by it. Um, because the last time I saw you, mm -hmm. you were presenting, I hosted you at yeah. AUC to present a paper exactly yeah. on reformers telling us how the the revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt were within the framework of a reformist mindset that is all up to in their um, um, setting. And now I'm found here, I find you back here, and with <laughs> a completely different position. I don't know about that, but um, anyway. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> so I would actually like to hear from you, um, how do you think that this kind of uh, uh, enterprise mm -hmm. advances on the line of Muslim reformers? Mm -hmm. Somehow you touched up on it. I'm not particularly um, um, sure <clears throat> I'm seeing where you're heading. Uh, the two examples that mm -hmm. you gave are equally troubling because the issue of polygyny, for instance, um, it's not just the, the wajim and the haram. It's also if you have a right, so the, if the man has a right to marry, mm -hmm then that right cannot be denied by the ruler. So um, that's quite, you know, uh, uh, agreed upon. So, and also on the element of accountability, um, applying your, I mean, your reading here, uh, the account, the office, the official can be held accountable only in as far as he breaches a wajib or a muharram or denies a right. That is, it's, it's restricting it to the bare uh, backbone uh, instead of expanding it, for instance, to accountability in the classical sense of Jewish siyasa. So, if you are, so my underlying concern mm -hmm. is that if we are actually trying to draw um, elements in our favor from um, classical sources, we might be overwhelmed with all the rest that comes with that. That is, you know, mm -hmm. outside those realms, there's no accountability. It's the full right of the ruler to do whatever. Um, and especially when you look at the issue of the Tawqi, the um, agency, and the, the truth, the, the conditions for that, um, Yes, sure, but then so the president can do whatever, right? If it's not the imam, it's the president, it's the ultimate source of authority, mm -hmm. the one that appoints, really, uh, would be the... So, um, and in that sense, it strikes me on another level, which is um, this debate doesn't seem to be happening. Right? Exactly as you pointed out, you know, we somehow all share the fact that we're in this postmodernist, Islamist kind of setting. Um, so, why do you think we should um, uh, add this, which seems to bring in more problems than solutions? Okay. Lots of things here. <laughs> Let me first off by saying, okay. you guys didn't read the other paper, so <laughs> you don't have the benefit of this. Um, I, I don't think this is inconsistent at all with what I said in the first mm -hmm. paper. Um, one of the things I didn't do in the first paper is point out what I think is one of the deficiencies in the Muslim modernist approach, and I implied it here, is that they still tend to view the Sharia as something self-standing outside of politics, right? That's why there's so much emphasis on reinterpretation, right? Now, um, Tahtawi, uh, uh, I think, is the best, actually, in this. But what he doesn't tell us, he's, he, he never, he's never explicit in explaining where the ruler gets his authority to engage in this process of reform and improvement of society. Like, so he takes this idea that... And tell us 
Who's this he's, in the, he's a very important Egyptian 19th century reformer. And I talked about him in this paper that John Luca is mentioning. Um, so he talks about this idea about the, that the ruler uses political and secular law to go beyond revealed law in this teleological process of, of, of civilizing the community. right? But what he doesn't talk about is where the, the ruler gets this authority. And so what I'm trying to talk about in this paper is the legal foundations for the authority of the ruler as a public official. Right? Where does that come from? That's what this, so I don't see the two as, in, as, as, as contradicting each other at all. I, what I'm trying to do is give a firmer foundation, a political foundation for these reforms as opposed to a theological one. Okay? Um, now, with respect to um, your, you, you're saying you're disturbed by my example of polygyny. Now, I take it for granted right, that this is a popular belief, that if God has given men a right to marry more than one woman, Right? then nobody can take that away. As a matter of fact, the Egyptian Supreme Constitutional Court has said that. Right? But I think that if they read substantive Islamic law, they would realize that that is wrong. There are numerous cases in pre-modern Islamic law where the jurists say explicitly, explicitly, that it is obligatory to obey rules of the imam, right? of the ruler, the president, whoever it is, right? as long as they do not command to sin. Right? And so the ruler can prohibit something that is permissible in pre-political law for the public good. Now, it might be that men really want to be able to have this, and <laughs> this privilege, and don't want to give it up. That's a different question, right? But um, I don't see any jurisprudential argument right, that justifies that position. Because there are lots of cases in, pre-modern in, in pre-modern law that suggest that that's not true. As long as it satisfies the requirements that it be for the public good, right? That it's not arbitrary, and that um, you know what I mean is it's a, it's a public issue. It's, a, it's not a private issue, right? Because I, as I said, the idea of, the, of, of the, the state being a public agent means that it can't interfere in private rights because it has no delegated authority to exercise my private rights. Now, people might argue: Is family law an appropriate part of public law or not? Right? We, you know, people can debate about that. But if we agree that family law is a proper part of public law, and it is constitutive of the public good. I see no principled reason why we can't say we could just ban it. Right? Now, again, I think one of the things that's interesting in the way Islamic public law develops is because it comes out of an analogy with private law. And there's no doubt that a Muslim male, as an individual, can uh, forego his right to marry a second woman. There are several ways he can do that. He can do that through a vow. Right? He can do that by giving his, his wife a conditional divorce. Um, so there are lots of ways that a private person can waive various private rights he has. Right? So it seems a fortiori that the, a public agent can do the same thing. Right? Again, provided that all the conditions of proper authority have been satisfied. Now, accountability. One of my points here, and I think this is crucial, is that everything that you find in the pre-modern literature about remedies that's simply an instantiation of the idea of a contract. It's not an exhaustion of what that contract might be. Right? So we are totally free to come up with our own kinds of constitutional remedies that are appropriate for our kind of government. Why? Because we are the principal. And in all cases, they're exercising our power. And, and I, I can't emphasize this enough. There is never, there's no doctrine in Sunni law that says a public official has inherent authority. He has no personal authority. His authority is always via this delegation. Right? So any authority he has must come from the community. Because if he exceeds it, he's just a private person is not worthy of obedience. Right? Because the basic rule is human beings are equal. We have no reason to obey one another. Right? The only reason we obey rulers is because they've gotten this valid delegation of power. And so any th the, the, the accountability we find in the past, yes, it's minimal, but it was you know, probably appropriate for 14th century Cairo, right? Not in 21st. But we're not limited to that because it's the community that is setting the terms of the public office, right? I hope that's... Where is the debate happening? Ah, it's not, right? I mean, unfortunately, you know, I don't, you know, I, one of my... Concerns. I, I just don't feel that there's, a, you know, mu real debate on what are the practical mechanisms now that we want to have. Now we have this opportunity, right, 
to set new rules for how we're going to collectively govern ourselves, it doesn't seem that it's really happening in a, an effective way. That there's a lot of ideological debate, there's a lot of debate at the level of slogans and, uh, for lack of a better term, exclusionary discourse. But in terms of talking about practical means of creating accountability, et cetera, it's, that I don't see it happening, unfortunately. Bernard Freeman. Yeah, so my question is sort of along the same lines, the same theme, although I'm a little more hopeful than, than uh, John Luca. Jim Luca. Uh, I agree with that your project's very ambitious and uh, courageous, actually. <laughs> But uh, my, when I read the paper, I was, uh, what came to my mind is H.L.A. Hart. Mm -hmm. H.L.A. Hart talked about if you're going to have a mature, so my question is really to have you expand a little bit more about where, if people did have this debate, they would go to find this body of law that you described as public acts, wh why and how they would conclude that that should be part of the constitutional law, such that you might have something that you might call a rule of recognition or some kind of uh, consensus that both Muslims and non-Muslims might be able to grab onto. And uh, that's why the main uh, thrust of my question, and I was worried, like Gianluca, about things like, uh, just not just uh, polygamy, but uh, charity and other kinds of rules that people regard as having, they have a religious obligation. So I'm thinking of the wild holocaust that it may be impossible to have an Islamic state because of these... Uh, yeah, you can think of everything I say as contra wow. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you can also comment on, on what you mean about uh, Wild's recent argument that it's, it's going to be impossible to construct an Islamic state. Um, okay. Let me try to get the first question. Um, part of what I'm trying to say is, if the normative ideal in Sunni political theory is that the state as an instrumentality is an agent of the community, right? Subject to certain per peremptory norms that limit that power both affirmatively and negatively, right? Then it really doesn't matter what was said in the past because we are free to develop our own public order, right? So we would do it from scratch? Well. I mean, there's a certain rationality to the, to the relationship of principal agent, right? And, you know, and we sort of unpack the implicit ideals that are within that relationship the way we understand them today, right? What do we want our agents to do for us? That's really the question, right? It's not what God told us. It's like, what do we want our agents to do for us? Do, do we want them to, do we want to educate ourselves? Do we want to, you know, have a redistributive economy? Do we want to have, et cetera? You know, right, there's lots of things we can choose, and we need to do so collectively uh, and, and, and together, right? Um, and I think the idea of a principal-agent relationship sort of implies that. So now, the historical inquiry is important solely to combat what I call this illusion that Islamic law imposes all these rules on us, right? And that's why it's important to do this historical inquiry, sort of to clear the underbrush, get it out of the way, so we don't think, so that we're not under this false impression, right, that because the jurist said, right, that a man has a private right, has an individual right to marry more than one woman, and conversely that a woman has a right to marry a man who's already married, that the issue is out of, the, out of, the, out of place for public deliberation, right? So that's the only reason we have to go through the historical exercise, right? Um, so that's sort of my, my view of it. Now, where are we going to do it? You know, I have to admit, my research has been greatly aided by advances in computer technology, right? Because I can do searches, right, across, you know, literally hundreds of books using keywords, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I, I said, you know, I alluded to this in the paper, it's unfortunate that the way pre-modern law books were structured, you don't have these rules systematized, but you, they're sort of scattered you know, sort of all over. You know, when I was talking, uh, answering John Luca's question about the limits of obedience, it's sh shockingly it comes up in this obscure chapter of ritual law, right? Dealing with the obligation, you know, what you know, there's, there's a drought, there's a specific, specific prayer, specific special prayer for rain that the ruler is supposed to lead. And in the law books it says, and it's obligatory to obey the, the, the ruler, 
right? You know, just a short sentence. What about ta'atu? Then you get into really detailed discussions of what the limits of obedience are that aren't limited to this prayer ritual, but go into, you know, public law and talk about, well, what if he orders us to pray extra prayers? Do we need to do that? No, because that's not, a public, that's not part of the public good, right? So it's, in some respects, from an external perspective, it sort of seems random where these issues might show up. But as I try to say in the paper, because they write from the perspective of the individual who is sort of hearing these rules, that's how, that's how these books are organized. Right? But it doesn't mean that an idea of public law is not there. It just comes up from the perspective of how the individual interacts with them. Right? That's why you sort of have to read everything, which you could never do before. But now with computer searches, it makes it a lot easier. Right? In ah, Wa'al. Islamic state. Yes, Wa'al. Um, I think Wa'al is an incredibly important scholar of Islamic law. And he's done you know, an inordinate, really great service to Islamic law. But I think his idea of politics and the state and how Islamic state, the Islamic law fits in it is more a reflection of his own sort of commitments as a Foucauldian than it has anything to do with what Islamic law says. That's my, my personal view. So I'll leave it there. All right, Osama and Azami. You're in the queue. You're next in the queue. Mm -hmm. Among other things, um, some of those have already been up, um, sort of raised. Uh, what are the prospects of influencing current debates, etc.? And that might be more sort of in the realms of higher Nikki Alban rather than in the in the debates at the uh, at, at law school. But um, I, I'm sort of wondering if uh, Ibn Taymiyyah comes up in your second book because I think Baba Johansson mentions that um, uh, he actually is one of the earliest scholars uh, who says that the caliphate isn't really As long as the community is functioning as a, as a community, they are the source of authority on that debate. And you were talking about how uh, modern um, discourse on uh, the Sharia and Sunday practice and life is really defined by these sorts of questions. How do you, uh, who's suited for the caliphate? Um, and can women uh, be involved in leadership or things like this? Very sort of specific questions rather than um, extricating themselves from that particular question. And and it seems surprising that someone like Ibn Taymiyyah isn't, um, I mean, perhaps my reading is limited, but hasn't uh, come up in, in a deep discussion. Well, I mean, one of the things that I do in my research is I try to focus on really sort of mainstream, um, run-of-the-mill, unextraordinary jurists, <laughs> right? Because what I try to do is try to identify baseline, non-controversial doctrine. Right? Somebody like Ibn Taymiyyah is a lightning rod. People either love him or hate him. He's an iconoclast in many ways. So it doesn't really do what I'm trying to do much, much, much work if I cite Ibn Taymiyyah because it's, oh, well, you know, he said all sorts of crazy things. He's not representative of anything, right? Right. But see, I think, I mean, I have not spent enough time uh, reading Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, like I said, I, most, of, most of the research I do now is just based on you know, an Arabic equivalent of Westlaw searches, trying to find the, the relevant cases and analyze them. Um, but uh, you know, I think uh, one of the interesting things, and this is something, if there are any Islamic studies graduate students here, could be an interesting project. Um, there are differences between the Hanbalis and others on these questions that are significant. right? So. Um, Mawardi, who was a Shafi'i, in his description of the contract of the caliphate, it's sort of like Cobb's in the sense that once, once the public order is established, private individuals no longer have any authority over the law. They give up all authority to enforce the law to the public. The caliph is the exclusive agent of now public authority. Now, this is then now uh, distributed to all other public officials, right? And so now people no longer have any private authority, right? The Hanbalis aren't like that. They preserve this idea that individuals have this direct unilateral power to enforce the law. And this comes up in rules of arbitration. So if you're talking about rights of God, 
So for the Hanafis and the Shafi'is and the Malikis, the arbitrator is very strictly circumscribed in what areas of the law he can adjudicate. Usually it's always got to be private rights because he draws his authority from the parties before him. But the Hanfalis will allow the arbitrator to even apply criminal law, including hudud, right? So, you know, I, I don't really, it just, the Hanfalis just don't have a lot of interesting things to say about this. I mean, they have interesting things to say, but not necessarily from my perspective, right? Um, I think they're, they're, they are not as politically sophisticated as the, if, if you're interested in a theory of public law, right? Uh, if you don't, if you don't like the idea of a state and stuff like that, maybe you, you'll find the Hanbalis more attractive, right? But since I like the state, the right kinds of states, right? Um, I, I don't. I just haven't come across any that much, you know. Even Farra in his uh, his book, that, which is the same, um, you know, he he gives you from the very beginning two alternative ways of creating the public order. I got called the Caliphate. The reason why I agree with Babur Johansson or Ibn Taymiyyah is because the person of the caliph is irrelevant. What's important is that there's a public order. This contract establishes a public sphere. That's what makes it crucial. That's why it's considered obligatory. Right? The person is irrelevant. Right? That's, it was always, you know, after the earliest periods, it was always irrelevant. But um, for Ibn Farah, he starts off talking that from the very beginning, he says that um, force is a legitimate way of establishing the contract. You know, people, if you read the secondary literature, they say this is Ibn Jama'ah in the 14th century. No, Farah is talking about it in the 5th century, and he's citing Ibn Hanbal to the idea that an alternative way of, co of creating this public sphere is through force of arms. Right? So they're much, you know, they're much less, you know, I, anyway. So, so I'm going to intervene with a, a question of clarification, then go next in the queue, and then we can return um, back to other questions that, that you and others have after that. Um, but, but it's something that Stephen Gargon and Bernard Freeman mentioned, and it seems to come up in this question as well, um, as to what you're doing here with respect to making arguments and which audience, um, what is the audience that you're aiming to convince? Because we have this rule of recognition that um, Bernard mentioned with respect to HLA Hart, um, and I thought you were go going to say oh, yes, well, you know, Islamic law is there. Islamists are saying they want to appeal to Islamic law. Here are some ways that they can better understand or have a conversation about political deliberation, um, drawing on Islamic law since the history of Islamic law seems to be so important to their conception. But you didn't say that. You said, oh, I'm just trying to clear underbrush and get on with it. Um, but then you tell Osama that you want to look at the mainstream doctrines that are present in, classic, in the classical Islamic legal tradition. But, but then I wonder why. Or well, because what? I think it's necessary to clear the underbrush. That the way to clear the underbrush is by appealing to mainstream doctrine and saying that, um, in fact, you know, Islamic law is not this body of self-executing doctrine that, you know, sort of to use Oliver Wendell Holmes's view of, you know, the, omnibru you know, the uh, brooding omnipresence, right, that's sort of imposing itself on us. Um, that binds, that, that's a straitjacket on us. Um, and so that's why I want to refer to mainstream theorists, uh, just as so I can clear that misconception, which I think is a common misconception among Islamists and non-Islamists, right? Um, now, who am I writing for? I don't know. I've never, I've been writing for a long time. I don't know who I write for. I write first for myself because there are things that I'm interested in, and I hope that other people will get on board. Um, but I, I, I assume that if I'm interested in them, other people will, will somewhat find it interesting too. Right, um, and uh, I've never, I never ever thought that anything I wrote would have any practical relevance. I'm still, I, I, I doubt that it has any kind of immediate practical relevance. But I, I do think that there is a role for, uh, for legal theory in trying to create a common political culture, which is a long-term project. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Sense of, a, of a political polity, right? A public official who has delegated powers 
and some kind of fiduciary relationship, right, which is a, a lot of where you get the theory of accountability. But then there's public in the sense of public sphere, and there's also public in the sense of a public issue, right? And I just wonder if you could say a little bit more about that, because I, I just don't know that that your use of the word public, as in you know the, the powers that would be given you know by a polity, right, to a public official, really would comprehend or and could do the normative work to be able to to critique or have a theory of accountability. You know, so take a transition, right? You have a shifting polity, right, and and therefore a shifting, I would say, understanding of what the duties of a public official would be. That's just one instance of where. You know, I don't know that having a one one definition of, a, of 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 the duties of a public official would be able to give you enough, would do enough work, you know, normatively, would be able to, you know, give a sense of, of what accountability was was owed. Another area that's been really contentious is the, is the shape of the public sphere and where you know what you know what what where one should get the definition of a public sphere. What you know is that a theological well, on a construct or a political one. And obviously, from, from a Western perspective, this is less loaded, right? Individuals can have their free expression rights in the public sphere, and it's not seen as something that is governed by, by the community and by a, you know, a political definition. So there's just a number of different places where I wonder about whether there's one, you know, one definition well, that would do the work. I think public and private is always contested. Well, right? yeah. It's always going to be contested. And the only, the only way I could answer you Right, in any sort of meaningful sense, besides just giving you my own opinions about where one should draw the line, right, is is to do a historic. You can do a historical study, right, and see where did pre-modern jurists, for example, how did they imagine the difference between a, you know, where the public started, stopped, and where did it end, right? That that's one of the reasons why I'm interested in looking at pre-modern doctrine, because I want to try to figure out exactly what were the kinds of boundaries that they imagined constituted the public. Well, what we know, for example, is that um, supererogatory acts of piety were certainly not part of, part of the public concern. Right? So the ruler couldn't ask people to become better Muslims. Right? That was just outside of, what a public, of the competence of a public agent. That doesn't mean that, of course, that we should all be better Muslims. Right? But it's not part of a public and in their conception. And so when, again, we would have to do a lot of actually sort of hard work to try to answer this question historically. Right? But prospectively, and I think that's where your question is going, I think it's a matter of political contestation and argumentation. Right? And this is we're going back to the idea that there is a, a normative domain for politics. Right? And so <coughs> people who are present, living, Today, have to define it for themselves through a mutual process, through a process of mutual deliberation. I don't think you know that sounds like a, a cop out, um, but that's the only way it can be done because there's always this sort of you know principle is not going to give you the you know the 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 detailed answers for all of these questions, right? But let me give an example when it comes to something like let's say public appearance dress, for example. I think it's very easy to make the argument from a wholly traditionalist perspective that there's absolutely nothing wrong right, with allowing women to go about unveiled in an Islamic society. And this has nothing to do with theological interpretation of the proper mode of dress, but has everything to do with Islamic conceptions of remedial law. right? Because um, there is no principle in Islamic law that says every sin must be punished. So punishment, crime and punishment, is something that's delegated to the public. So the public has power over determining what kinds of things it wants to punish and what it will not punish. Right? So you have pre-modern jurors saying, you know, there are lots of sins that are too trivial to worry about. Right? There's, no, there's, no, there's no affirmative obligation for an Islamic public to police every single act. Right? And so um, there's, there's stuff there that can be used that's serviceable. Right? But it's never going to give a definite answer without political contestation. And so what people need to do now is try to develop institutions that can manifest what the public wants. Right? And again, this is you know, trying to tie it back to give some sort of practical flesh to what I'm doing. Or I think the implications of this is that 
okay, if, if normativity is based on this principal-agent relationship and we have the power to define what our agent can do and what she can't do and how we're going to, we, it's within our capacity to determine how we select them, what they're going to do, um, you know, how we were going to hold them accountable. All these things are open for us to decide. And we don't have to feel that we're betraying our religious principles by doing so. Right? Or that by saying that we are committed to these principles, that we are excluding the possibility of common deliberation. So there are a couple of people remaining on the queue, but if this has all prompted further discussion, please re-raise your hand. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, David. Yeah, you can add me to the queue if you want. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> yes, please. I'd be interested in the interpretation of the Shiite Tempestron. And it would be great if you could please comment on the relationship between authority of an agent and immunity, Sharia, something outside and within politics, and the overlap between Islamic constitutional essentials and post enlightenment. This is a dangerous question because you're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> because I'm going to come, I know I'm going to come off as a horrible <laughs> sectarian, which is bad. Um, but I think you know uh, there's a fundamental division, as we know, or if we don't know, we should know, between uh, Sunni conceptions of the public and Shi conceptions. Uh, the Shi, as far as I can tell, and I don't want to get crucified for saying this, um, I don't see a room for a public in Shi theology. Because their whole idea of legitimacy is based on the authority of, 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 uh, of a divinely inspired ruler. So after the prophet dies, there has to be a divinely designated imam. Right? The prophet appoints Ali, Ali appoints Hassan, Hassan appoints Hussein, etc., etc. And then the twelfth imam goes into hiding. The jurists, that's why it's called Wilayat al faqih the, the jurisdiction of the jurist. The jurists, according to, as far as I understand, Twelver theology, right, they are exercising the power of the imam. Right? They, they are agents of a principal who is this imam. They are not agents of a community. Right? So they don't have, as far as I can tell, I don't see a space, a conceptual space for a public in Shia theology. Now that doesn't mean that she, that, that, that Shias are incapable of doing this. I'm just saying that within their theology, it's very hard to get there. So they might have to disregard it. So if you read the work of 19th and 20th century ayatollahs, right, what they end up trying to do, they, they incorporate some of these Sunni ideas of, of, of agency, right? They, but they do it as a, very, as a very kind of second best kind of theory, right? That all government in the absence of the imam is illegitimate, because only the imam has a legitimate authority over human beings. So every kind of government in his absence is a type of usurpation. But a government that respects rights is the least bad of the non-imamic alternatives. Right? That's how I understand Shi political theology. I, I could be mistaken. I don't want to claim I'm, I'm an expert on it. But they really are radically different conceptions of authority. So they don't have an idea of wilayat al-Muslimin the way Kassani does, right? It's wilayatul faqih, the authority of the jurist who's acting on behalf of the imam, who's acting on behalf of God. So this would indicate that there is no overlap between uh, Islamic constitutional essentials and Well, from the Shi, from the Shi I mean, I think it's highly, very, very problematic. Very, very problematic. Is this in theory, or you would say that there's also something practical? Well, you know, if you look at the Iranian Constitution, that's why it's a mess, right? Because you've got this re these republican institutions, but then yeah, yeah. Well, what I, what I mean is like the present Iranian Constitution tries to bridge this gap by creating republican institutions, but at the same time you have this cleric who sits on top who's exercising jurisdiction on behalf of the imam, right? And essentially can trump any of the decisions that the representative institutions can make, right? And so, um, again, that's why it's, it's very, very problematic. You don't have those same kinds of problems
in the Sunni conception because there actually is the community actually has authority to make rules for itself, right? And I would just add a slight footnote here that so this is one Shi'i conception, right? And it is the one that the Iranian government has adopted from Khomeini, but of course, you know, Mudarisi and other scholars have written in the area of the theology that says. Well, it wasn't a divine designation. No, I understand which, that, uh, but which creates the problem. Well, if it's a divine designation, this person is standing in place, actually, of the prophet with some relationship to God, then you can't have any intervening. What I understand the internal debate among Shia to be is as follows: is that um, there is no imam today, right? So it's either impossible to have a legitimate government, or you have legitimate government through the offices of clerics who exercise power on behalf of the missing imam. But or I don't the know. The third alternative is if you don't have a. I just don't know if any. Divinely inspired imam on which anyone is acting on behalf of. Instead, you have someone who is rationally guided because they were uh, particularly knowledgeable. Then you have uh, a basis for. Secular, if we use that term. Okay. I don't know about that, Intasar. I mean, um, okay, I don't think there's. That, it's, it's I don't think there's. I've never come across this she a, a religious she theory as a theological justification for secular rule, as a first ba as a legitimate sort of set of institutions, right? And so that's why I pointed there's second to, to second the best. Literacy, so he has an no, no, there, 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 there are plenty of second so. bests. I don't deny that, but they're all because of you know because of necessity, right? Because the imam isn't around. So we we make do by the least best the least uh, the least worst alternative. But I don't know of any idea that the that the political community has authority to make rules for itself. That's all I'm saying. The, the only thing is that the authority of the agent in the case of Iran made the uh, the imam both in the case of Khomeini and later on with Khamenei. We can we can hear in fact. Now whether that is accepted by Shiite. Well, is a separate issue, but they are using the term. Okay, I don't want to. I'm, look, I, I want to caveat everything I just said by saying I'm not an expert in Shiism. But you know, one thing that I find interesting, I was reading a fatwa of Sistani in Iraq, uh, in which he was asked, a, a, a Shi was asking him, "Am I under an obligation religiously to carry out the decision of an Iranian court?" Right, and he basically said. Only if it conforms with what Jafari Fiqh tells you, right? He doesn't recognize any independent authority for the public institutions of the Islamic Republic of Iran, right? And so, he, and if you read Shi Fiqh books, I mean, I, haven't, I don't know them nearly as well as Sunni Fiqh books, right? But if you look at the definition of a judge, for example, anybody can be a judge if they have the requisite uh, criteria of learning. You don't need a delegation. The delegation is totally irrelevant. If you have the learning that makes you a mujtahid, then you are a judge. You don't need an appointment. Matter of fact, appointment is totally irrelevant because he tells you if the Iranian judge gives you something, that doesn't change anything. It's irrelevant to whether or not you can exercise it or comply with it or anything. The only issue is, is that judge, from the perspective of Shi law, sufficiently learned? Right. So he's totally indifferent to the political institutions that exist. They're irrelevant as far as he's concerned. And that's what I'm saying. In Sunni fiqh, from the very beginning, you always have to have a valid delegation of power, no matter how learned, how pious, etc. You always have to have a valid delegation of power. Sujit, you can... Sure, or maybe I think Hannah's been waiting. see that in the Egyptian constitutional process as it's unfolding, that there's not a lot of debate about, you know, the 
how to hold the president accountable, for example, and that a lot of the strike is really focused on these more substantive hot button issues. Um, so I want to suggest that maybe your audience is actually the monarchy, that maybe it's, you know, in Jordan and Morocco and even Saudi Arabia, that there could be a legitimate argument about the role, like that religion as the basis of the constitutional order is already being discussed. And I was just wondering what you thought about that. Interesting. <laughs> it's, it's funny, because I think the monarchies are the worst example, right? If you're, um, they're, they're very interesting actually, because people oftentimes mention these monarchies as Islamic, moder as Islamic states, sort of par excellence. But when you look at their constitutions, they are, they are in fundamental ways contradictory to the Sunni tradition, right? Um, pre precisely with respect to issues of succession. By vesting, um, by vesting uh, rulership in a family, right? They're sort of violating the, the, fundamental, the fundamental doctrine as I elaborate it, right? That there, there is no such thing as personal authority, right? That it's always delegated and that the community always has to have the choice of who its agents are, right? And so by trying, that's the only reason why these countries have constitutions is to, is to control the rules of succession, right? Um, and so I find them actually to be much, much, much further away from any kind of engagement with these kinds of ideas because they are still very much in a personal mode of rule and they're trying to secure a personal mode of rule. I didn't even realize the extent to which they are literal manifestations of personal rule until, um, if I can share an anecdote, I, when I started teaching law, my first summer I went to Dubai um, because I wanted to sort of, I thought I was going to do a lot of research on capital markets and the Gulf, et cetera. And I started researching their capital markets laws. And the laws are literally issued in the, the personal name of the ruler, <laughs> right? There's no idea of political community at all. There's just these people, these persons who have absolute authority and who are telling us what to do, right? And so I don't, I don't think there's any debate there at all. Now in Egypt, something very interesting that happened a couple of days ago, which will be curious to see how it plays out. In the context of the, co the constitutional debates, I was always, I was completely un underwhelmed by the religious provisions of the Constitution because I said from the very beginning that everything in this Constitution regarding religion, right, is meaningless because it doesn't give non-state bodies any power to determine anything, right? And so two days ago in the Majlis Ashura, which is the upper house of the Egyptian parliament, there was a debate about, you know, um, the government wants to enter into loans with the IMF and the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development, et cetera. And uh, the Salafi party is opposed to it because they say these, these loans are, are sinful, they're haram, they're forbidden. And so they were demanding to get the opinion of the Azhar per Article 4 of the Constitution. And the Isam al Aryan, who is like this leading figure of the Muslim Brotherhood, stood up in a speech and said, in this Constitution, all power comes from the people. We respect the Azhar, we love to hear their opinion, but they have no veto power over this, and we're not going to ask them. We have the, we, this Constitution gives us the right to ask them when we want to. We don't want to. End of story. Right? So, um, it's, I, 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 again, I mean, this is why I think actually in places like Egypt and Tunisia, it is very relevant, right? Because there is this real debate about how do you reconcile popular sovereignty with this concept of normative legitimacy that's derived from revealed law, right? And I, and, you know, I think there's a principled way of doing it besides just deciding when you want to and when you don't, right? So I have two questions, and I think Bernie's after, after me. So, so the, the first question is analytic, and the sec second question is political. So the analytic question is about the relationship between revealed law, I'm using your terms, yeah. po um, popular sovereignty or exercises of it, um, and, uh, and, uh, and essentially how they interrelate, okay? And so you use the term uh, peremptory or preemption. So the idea is that you know, we can have politics and political institutions that can issue laws. And the, the, the constraint that exists under the Sunni conception 
of political order is that, uh, is that those laws can't collide with, revealed, with duties imposed by revealed law, right? Or it can't, you know, and so, or, and so the, and then, and then if they do, then the revealed law preempts public law or public statute. Now, another way to think about the relationship between revealed law and an ordinary law uh, is not through uh, notions of uh, preemption, but through proportionality, mm -hmm. right? And so the, the idea then is that if there is a, a conflict between revealed law and statute, that it's, it's not that the revealed law is a showstopper mm -hmm. or a trump, right? That there is then a process of reason giving and justification that might nonetheless so that, that is, it is different, right? There is, a, there is a question of what the purpose is underlying the law. You know the drill, right? You know, what's the, is there a rational connection? Is it the least restrictive means? At the end of the day, the, 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 you know, the, when the rubber hits the road, it might be that, in fact, the, the law, the statute, wins out mm -hmm. over revealed mm -hmm. law under, under proportionality, right? Although revealed law is given strong weight. So that's the first quest, analytic question. Mm -hmm. The second question is a political question, and it kind of builds up on the question about uh, the Shia conception of political order, right? So imagine you are your, so that, and it goes to the question of who the principal is in the story, right? Is the so so the way this is set up, the principal is the Sunni Muslim community. So imagine you're in a plural state, okay? So you're either let's say you're in Egypt, and you've got the Copts, or you're in Syria, okay? And and you're now searching for a modus vivendi, modus vivendi, in these very plural contexts. Right or Iraq, mm -hmm. right or mm -hmm. Lebanon or what have you, right? And, and so the question is, what kind of force does this type of argument have in a context of plural of, of of you know deep diversity or radical pluralism, right? It's not kind of it, you know where you kind of basically have a fundamentally different conceptions of what political order might be, right, within the state. And so what work does this do, right? So the audience for this, you know, Tunisia. Mm -hmm. Right? What, what, how does this cash out? Right? In the other, in the other states where the demography mm -hmm. and and the kind of the, the topography of religious pluralism is quite different. Right? So yeah. let me. Can I like append? Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. In your paper, you talk yeah. about how the moral obligation of someone to obey is a Okay. Yeah. Let me start with the first question because it's uh, easier, yeah. right? Yeah. What I was trying to do in this paper is just talk about sort of, you know, pure ideal theory first best. Right. Right. Clearly, there, what you're talking about would be a sort of a second best, where right. you where force of circumstance requires you to modify your uh, your first best ideals. Yeah. Uh, that tradition exists in Islamic law, right. right? Right. And it's certainly there. I didn't want to develop it in that yeah, yeah. in this paper. But there is this ideal. There are two kinds of what I call uh, two types of two types of obedience to law in the classical Sunni tradition. One is what I would call sort of the moral obligation, in which one is bound to a rule deontically, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's the right rule, and one apply and one follows it, right? And that includes legitimately produced political law. If it's legitimately produced, one has a deontic obligation to abide mm -hmm. by it. Mm -hmm. But there are other kinds of rules that mm -hmm. one has a prudential obligation to apply, mm -hmm. to, to abide by, right? Precisely for these kinds of things that you're talking about. Right? So both kinds of obligation exist. I was, this paper deals pr primarily with the idea of the first sort of deontic duties. Um, now, from that perspective, we then get to the second point, yeah. right? I think it's perfectly legitimate from the perspective of, in, of Islamic law right, to talk about why a, a purely deontic theory of an ideal Muslim community is not appropriate in a pluralistic world. Right? But, and that the Muslim, the, the, even an ideal Muslim moral agent or moral principle is entitled right, for prudential reasons to make other kinds of, accept other kinds of um, political arrangements for the sake of peace. For the sake of peace, prosperity, 
um, everybody getting along. It's a crowded planet type of type of thing, right? Um, now, uh, so I don't. I, I think obviously you would have to do it. But the first thing that what I think is very important is first figure out ideal theory, right? right? And that gives you a more, um, I guess, what I would say, a firmer basis for the kinds of prudential compromises you make in the empirical world. Because mm -hmm. what you don't want, you don't want people to think that you're purely decisionist. I mean, that's right now the mm -hmm. big problem in Egypt. People say the Muslim Brotherhood has no principles. All it does is just decide based on, you know, pure, narrow, pragmatic interests, right? When I think actually there's a case to be made that a lot of its decisions are not just in that, in that way, right? I mean, a state needs to be built, right, in Egypt. Now, it happens to be that they're the ones that are right now in, in charge. But it, from the external perspective, it looks like they're abandoning any kinds of pretense to, to uh, commitment to Islamic principle and just doing whatever they want, right. right? And that is what's very dangerous in destroying legitimacy, right? Decisionism is, is bad, right, for purposes of stab stability, right? And so that's why it's important to have an idea of ideal theory so that you know why these kinds of um, proportionality arguments are not, are not just opportunistic. Okay? Now, to your point, again, I think classical Islamic law provides a framework for thinking about this because pre-modern Muslim jurists did think about this problem. How is it possible for non-Muslim individuals to be bound by Islamic law? Right? And so they debated about what rules can be applicable to non-Muslims and what rules can't. Right? And so they came up with this notion of a basically contractual undertaking by non-Muslims to abide by Islamic law. And in doing so, they said that that contractual undertaking, by definition, can't include religious obligations. Right? It makes no sense to assume that a non-Muslim would, would agree to abide by much Muslim religious rules because they don't believe in Islam. Right? On the other hand, rules of contract, rules of tort, rules of criminal law, et cetera, because this is part of the public, right? Um, they can be bound by that. It's rational for them to be bound by that, right? So there is still, there is also a contractual element when dealing with, with non-Muslims, which I think, again, helps uh, get us to that proportionality inquiry that, that, that uh, Sujit is raising. finds ways to, if not compromise, at least accommodate uh, secular, secular values and which is divided between uh, views that are deeply held religious and, and more secular, and more secular uh, attitudes. I guess what I want to, it seems to me when I listen to you, it seems to me that what you're trying to do, and please tell me if I'm getting this right, right or wrong, is you're trying to avoid both the dichotomy uh, between Either we're going to have Sharia law or we aren't going to have Sharia law. And you're also trying to avoid the cherry picking, uh, which is to say the, right. the standard way is that, well, we're going to have Sharia law, but you know what? This thing really doesn't mean what it says it means because somebody in the 11th century, and I, who actually most of the rest of what he or she said, he said, is absolutely garbage, but nonetheless, <laughs> this particular quote, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> using the powerful internet tools that we now have available uh, that does sustain this point of view. And that gets to be not very useful because um, it really becomes a, 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 I mean, a debate that no reasonable person can believe because it is this kind of cherry picking that's going on. What, what I take you to be trying to do is to look at very broad principles, mm -hmm. principles like not everything is a sin need to be punished. Uh, principles um, like the public, um, not everything that is allowed, um, um, sorry, that is allowed can, uh, cannot be forbidden because in fact, um, if there's a public interest, we can in fact restrict the domain of what people can 
have rights to do when there are compelling public reasons to do this. And you've identified a sort of set of very general principles in public law. Now, you don't, in my view, and I've only really skimmed, looked at the paper, you don't really lay these out in the way that mm. I, as a political scientist, would have liked you to, to lay these out. Mm. Literally as sort of numbered points, mm. you know, these are the broad general principles mm. that would allow me to go to my primary audience, which is not any of the ones mentioned so far, which are the constitutional courts um, in these new democracies, and to provide those constitutional courts a way to say, well, you know, the, it's okay. It's not a problem if we didn't take this to the Islamic court. Because after all, Islam allows for a public sphere, and in the public sphere, um, we are the agents of the interpretation of the public will, uh, and there was a clearly non-immoral act that was legitimated by the legislature and is being implemented, and so no problem. You know, Islamic, no Islamic problem, and no uh, Secular constitutional problem, yeah. problem given the constitution of, you know, of this particular country. So it seems to me that that's, for me, that's where your audience ought to be, and the way to make the audience there is to, is to try to clearly, even more clearly than you have in this paper, enunciate those foundational principles. I agree. That's a, I, I just think it's a different paper, right? Um, I mean, this paper is abstract, and I, I'm trying to write it from a very you know, theor perspective of legal theory, right? Um, and I, I do think that it can be sort of, uh, for lack of a better term, operationalized within a particular legal sort of discourse much better, right? But I, I do think that that's a sort of a different kind of paper because here I think too many people, too many people who actually make it their professional specialty to study Islamic law tell us that there really is no conception of of a, of a state, of public life, et cetera, that it's all, re it's all religious law, right? And so we, we, we really have this binary that's hegemonic among people who do Islamic law. And it wouldn't be so bad if it were just limited mm -hmm. to specialists of Islamic law, but it's, you know, it's sort of out there and it's going around and circulating and, and people who don't know, you know, I don't, I don't blame them. You know, you can't, you don't, can't know everything. They'll pick up a book by a recognized scholar in the field. They'll read it and say, oh, well, see, Islam has no idea of public order, and so therefore, how can there be democracy in these countries, et cetera, right? And so this is why I think I try to take, it, take this approach in this paper, but you're absolutely right. I think, um, you know, uh, I should try to sort of operationalize it in a way that is much more usable in a, in a judicial setting, right? Great. So with apologies to those still in the queue, we'll end this, this portion of the session. And I want to thank Muhammad for going above and beyond as he usually does. I, <laughs> I knew from before that um, for any of you um, balking at uh, law firm billable hours, sort of 1,000, 1,500 seems like a lot. Muhammad built over 3,000. Um, oh, come on. It's <laughs> <laughs> but it's indicative of the way that he and his scholarship in here and elsewhere goes above and beyond. So thank you. You're